recent study conducted by Gallup revealed that 93% of employees do not feel that internal communications are accurate, timely, or transparent. Furthermore, it is estimated that poor communication in the workplace can annually cost businesses an estimated $420,000 a year. As leaders, of course, communication effectively is the lifeblood to productivity, success, and ensuring that those that you are in charge of leading are inspired to follow your direction because of your stellar communication. If you're in a position of leadership, this is a podcast that you can't afford to skip over. Because you see, Lorianne Mortabito is excited to answer a question which, as a leader, could help you inspire your team, create avenues for further conversation and improve productivity all at the same time. What would learning public speaking and communicating with confidence do to your business or career? Well, according to Morabito, it would increase your bottom line by an estimated 81%. As a master presentation and speaking coach to some of the top leaders in Fortune 1000 and 500 companies, Lorianne isn't someone who believes that speaking can make a difference because she's lived it and she knows it to be true. And she's on a mission to ensure that Business leaders and entrepreneurs alike open up the lines of communication to ensure that their employees know and those around them are also educated on the fact of them being open-minded, conversational, and open to expanding themselves as communicators to grow as leaders and as people. And Lorianne joined me this week to tell me more. I'm Kevin McShane. Let's have this conversation. Okay. Absolutely. Now, Lorianne, I'm going to start our conversation by asking you sort of a off the beat and past question because I'm fascinated in the work that you do and the life that you've lo- lived. If I gave you a million dollars to produce a commercial about your life and I asked you to focus on your defining moment of difference, what do you think you would start? And what do you think that commercial would consist of? Tell me. Well, one of those pivoting moments for me was when I was working at a grocery store as a really shy woman. And I remember watching my fellow colleagues make eye contact really easy and just talk with people. And I, I literally remember the moment and saying to myself, you know what? 
me not looking at people when they're speaking to me is not going to serve me in the long run. I have no idea why I thought that long term. But that moment literally changed me. Because I was like, let me just try looking at somebody while they're talking to me and see what happens. And you know what I found out is that the world did not open up and swallow me whole, Kevin. <laughs> it just, it just, it just was, it was like, it was normal, like nothing bad happened. And I thought to myself, which again, I'm not like this was positive. This was a reinforcement. It was like, wow, maybe I could do it again, but a little bit longer. And that like, it was, it's, we really, all of us are the accumulation of taking baby steps baby steps in a direction. And I didn't do it for anybody else, but for myself. And now, like, and now here I am, like, I teach other people, how to use speaking as your best form of marketing, how to communicate what they do with confidence. You know, and I, and I gotta say, like, it was all because of that one moment. Absolutely, yeah. And just before I, I ask you my uh, next question, I'll share with you sort of my own uh, defining moment of, of difference in the spirit of being fair and equitable on uh, global accessibility and awareness day. So, uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure how much uh, research you did on me, but anyone that watches and listens to this podcast knows that I was born with what's called a spastic quadriplegia uh, cerebral palsy. Simply means that I mm -hmm. don't have enough oxygen in my legs to walk normally. And you know, my uh, defining moment of difference, Lorianne, happened when I was uh, nine years old. I didn't know it at the time, but that was uh, the year that I found out that I wouldn't be able to walk for the duration of my life without assistance. And I had to go back to school the next day, day uh, you know, the day after the surgery, my last surgery for my disability. Yeah. And, uh, and I credit my middle school principal, her name was uh, Dr. Carol Crowley. Uh, and the day after I came back from London, uh, I had to go back to school. And I went to Dr. Crowley's office because she knew that I was in London the previous day and she was going, I was going to learn that I wasn't going to be able to walk. So she brought me to her office and she left a big space in the middle of her office for my wheelchair and she had all of the people assigned to my file from uh, teachers to social workers uh, to therapists and my parents were there and I went through the story of what the doctor had told me the day before. And she looked at me and she said, the only limitations on your life are the artificial ones that you place on yourself. And I really think that was the uh, turning point of my life. So in the uh, spirit of fairness, I just wanted to share that with you as well. Thank you. And I have a, I have a cousin who has cerebral palsy. And I remember him being told that he would never walk. And he actually is a dance choreographer. Oh, he does. He, he does walk, and I want to share another story. That there's a gentleman, and he has since passed away. He was my first husband's best friend, and he and he actually lived down the street from where I am right now. And he's been in a wheel. He had been in a wheelchair for about since the age of eighteen. Um, he passed away when he was um, just a couple of years ago, so he was uh, right around the age of sixty. And you know what? I was always like he inspired me. For somebody like the only thing that he ever asked people for help for was like, hey, I can't get that box that my wife put on that top shelf. But he owned a tattoo store. He oh. owned a Harley Davidson motorcycle part and repair shop. He also um, his last business was he made custom knives. And when I say they were gorgeous, they were gorgeous. Like, okay. but you're so right. I mean, like you look. I would look at Dom, his name is Dominic, and it's just like, he wasn't handicapped. I mean, he might have been in a wheelchair, but nothing, nothing stopped him. <laughs> you know, I always say that inclusion is the 
gateway to independence. It's sort of my <laughs> motto that I live my life by. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to start this podcast was I wanted to break down the barriers to inclusion and have uh, uh, conversations with experts like yourself about bridging uh, the gap of division and, and unity so that we can all become closer together. And I think communication is a great way to do that, isn't it? It really is. And it's about like, communication is a two way street. It's not just how you communicate, but it's also how you listen. So it's, you know, like, communication is about using your voice, sharing your thoughts, but also being willing to listen to other people's thoughts and opinions and stories and experiences. So that me, the listener, or you, the listener can put ourselves in their story it's almost like walking that mile in somebody else's shoes, but we have to listen with with an open heart. We have to listen with open ears. We have to listen without thinking about what we're going to say next. Uh, it's, uh, I always tell people it's important when you communi- communi- communicate not to sound like a robot, right? Oh, Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and I hope that you feel that I'm communicating with you like from my open heart. Absolutely. And for you, I'm curious, what does communicating with confidence really mean? It means sharing your thoughts and voice with things about your past, with things about what you, whatever you're going through right now, with how you want the world to be. And not worrying about what's somebody going to say? What's somebody else going to think? How am I going to be judged if I say this? If I sh- So it's about sharing, you know, standing up nice and tall and just and sharing your thoughts with those that are around you. It also builds really good communication. Because when I'm courageous enough to share my thoughts, my deepest thoughts, you are going to share your thoughts with me as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Lauriette, I also know that you're a, a, a motivational and public speaker. And I wanted to ask, I've been wanting to ask you this question all week. So here it goes. So okay. <laughs> how important is it as a speaker to clearly define what, what we both know as an expert positioning statement? How important is it? To really narrow down and drill down on an expert positioning statement in order to bring the most amount of value to the biggest audience possible. I think it's very important to have that statement, that clearly defined statement, because it helps like a meeting planner, whether I'm coming to your website, decide, is this the right person for the conference or the meeting that I am planning an event for? You know, a lot of meetings and conferences have themes and you may not be the perfect person for this conference, but because they understand exactly what it is that you do, they can then like, they'll keep you in the back of their mind for another event. This happened to one of my clients. She, there was a conference that was on a cruise ship that she so desperately wanted to be a part of, and she's a storyteller. And this was like a marketing cruise um, was the event. And she sent a proposal and heard crickets, crickets for two years. And then out of the blue, she got an email because she was perfect for one of the events that they were hosting and they needed an expert on storytelling. So that's why like when people know exactly what it is that you do, that value statement you'll be placed in the right rooms. It it certainly makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Laura, for any business owner or leader who's great at sort of the technical aspect of their job and growing uh, the bottom line from a profitable standpoint, but isn't that a great communicator? What do you think of the keys? helping uh, business leaders or entrepreneurs 
become better communicators? How can they uh, communicate with confidence even when it's not necessarily in their wheelhouse? Well, I think when you are giving a presentation is knowing exactly what the point of the presentation is. So I am a big fan that when I'm working with my clients, I always have them do the Stephen Covey thing. And that is start with the end in mind. When you are done saying your last words, you know, just before the applause, what do you want? And so these are the goals that you should start with before you start crafting a presentation. What do you want the audience to think? What do you want the audience to do? What do you want the audience to believe after you're done speaking? And when to answer those three questions, then it's like you have a goal in mind. You know where like, like it's almost like GPS. Like I know where I'm going to. So that then you can craft the presentation because knowing what those goals are, What has to be in the presentation? What stories do you have to tell? What facts do you have to give and share with the audience so that they, your goals are accomplished? They think what you wanted them to think. They do what you wanted them to do. And they believe what you wanted them to believe. And sometimes it's just about opening up people's minds. But what has to be in the presentation to have that goal achieved? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm also... uh big believer in the power of diversity of perspective because, you know, with uh, no matter how smart you are or how many many degrees you have behind your name, you can always learn something new from somebody else. I'm a firm believer in that. So tell me about the power of perspective and how empowering it is as a speaker to learn from other people. Oh, huge to learn from other people. And one way that a speaker can actually share different perspective is through the power of stories. Because the speaker may have one perspective, but then tell a story about a client or an employee or somebody that he met while recording a podcast on a Thursday afternoon. (laughs) And just tell like the story from their point of view. Or something that you learned about that person. So that's one way to bring in different um, points of view into a presentation. And it's also very entertaining because we're using stories. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I shared with you, uh, before we started recording, I um, uh, spent a great deal of time working with organizations to help them amplify the the hiring of folks with uh, disabilities. So tell me, how do you think we can create a more equitable space uh, in both the speaking space and the business space for individuals with disabilities? How do you think we can make those two spaces more inclusive? I think that there's a lot of work that we can do and also a lot of work that needs to constantly be done. Because my first husband that I was sharing with you, it was his best friend who lived down the street. My first husband was in a wheelchair. And I remember, you know, like, and and like, I, I'm the walking wife. And I would walk into places and be like, it says that it's handicap accessible. But it's not really like, it wasn't a very accessible, like for someone like my husband. I think that there are very general um, guidelines for, and, and I'm just talking about like the physical disability, but I I myself have spoken for organizations who companies that bring in um, people with disabilities and everybody, this is what I learned when I, when I was working for them, everybody brings their unique talents. You know, like the bodies that we're in, this is just a packaging there is still a human being that's deep inside. And sometimes we just have to spend time like getting to know them, you know, and what their skills are, maybe even what they want to learn. And I know that that does not answer the question. (laughs) I kind of got off on a little tangent, but I think the bottom line is that there's still a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. 
and it and I don't foresee that it will ever be done. I think it will constantly be something that like we're always going to be working on this. We're human beings. We're trying to get it. We're we're all just trying to get along. Oh, isn't that the truth? It's the constant conversation of uh, how to move the needle of progress forward, isn't it? Yes, yes. And that whatever we know today will be like in five years, we'll be ancient. Okay. And some of the ideas, some of the ideas that we're going to be using in just two years. It's going to be like, wow, I can't believe what they were doing back in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, 20 years from now, people are going to be asking you, what the heck was a VCR, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, absolutely. Well, and I'm also curious to ask you, for yourself personally, I'm fascinated to ask you about how big of a role does self reflect uh, self reflection play in your own life when you look to grow, expand, and prosper. I'm fascinated. Well, so I don't think. I'm first going to say that I don't think everybody reflects and is in, and is even um, even looks inward on themselves. Um, I'm a big fan of, and this comes from my leadership coaching days, like to always reflect back in order to move forward. So that's a, like, if you asked me, like, what was your best speech, Lorianne? I'm going to say my next one because I'm constantly getting better. And I'm always reflecting on, okay, what went well? What didn't go well? What do I wish I had done differently? But I don't think everybody does that. And it's not to say that they don't know to do that. I think we just get caught in all the to-dos of the day. And it's like, I'll reflect on it later. I'll reflect on it later. And later just never comes. But I think it's through reflection that that's how change happens. And that change has to happen in ourselves first in order for us to see it outward. It's like what Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. And I fully embody that. And it's just been something that I've always lived by is like, I need to be the change that I want to be in whatever relationship I'm in with whomever you know, I need to be that, be the change that I want to see in whatever my position is like in a job. But as a speaker, like I just need to, I need to reflect in order to stay relevant also. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to that point, Lauren, I always tell people that life is what you make of it. You know, adversity is going to strike all of us. Mm -hmm. At one point or another in our life, but at, I made this this point in uh, the speech I gave this afternoon because the audience asked me, "How do I overcome adversity, and how, how do I tell my own inclusive story?" And I told them I use my disability as a strength of perspective because. I'm able to look at the world differently than uh, someone that may be able-bodied. But I'm also uh, curious to ask you, what do you think it means to be aggressively assertive when it comes to capturing our own definition of greatness? Because everyone's portrait of success is different, isn't it? Well, it is. And I think also, at, well, I'm going to speak for myself. I also think that through the course of time, you know, your own definition of success changes. My definition of success when I was in, when I was a teenager or when I got out of college is very different than what it is today. And I think that's true for a lot of people. But again, let's go back to the self-reflection and reflecting on like, what does success mean for me versus me watching some TV show, me looking at, you know, and comparing myself to some influencer who has their own definition of success. So I think it's about, you know, like we all have to go inward and decide, well, what is being successful and how can I feel successful today and not wait for it to happen one day? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, you know, 
as a motivational speaker myself, one of the things that I try to do is tap into the authentic mo moment of the audience. And what, what I mean by that is that I try to meet people where they are and really mm -hmm. relate uh, my own personal experience to the topic that I'm talking about. Because I think when you're authentic as a speaker, your message carries more weight. So tell me about the importance of authenticity as a speaker from your point of view. Well, first of all, I do think the word authenticity is so overused now. Isn't it? I, don't about you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I just feel like it's so overused. But what, is it, what does it mean to be real in front of people? Um, I'm going to share with you as somebody who I came from the leadership speaking um, industry. And in the beginning of my speaking career, you know, it was just like, like, if you're a leadership speaker, you have to be wearing a suit and heels and come across as extremely professional. And you know what, like that, just like wearing the, the beautiful suit just wasn't me. You know, I prefer to, you know, like wear a dress um, or just wear something that made me feel like more like myself. And I got to tell you that when I started doing that, better stories came out. I felt more comfortable in front of the audience. When I made a mistake or, you know, like forgot what I was going to say next because I was answering somebody's question, you know, it's like you get to just be real with them. And I remember like looking down at somebody and saying, because I had answered a question from the audience and I was just like, what was I talking about before? And they just laugh. So I think being, me being myself, I think anybody just being yourself is the best gift you can give everybody. It's the best gift you can give yourself. It's the best gift you can give whomever you're in relationship with or the audiences that you're speaking with. Be yourself because that's the person that the audience is going to fall in love with. Yeah, and it allows you to be more genuine in receiving responses from an audience, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And Lauren, I know that you're uh, currently based in Boston. So tell me, why do you love living out on the East Coast? And, and what's the best part about living in Boston? Well, I live north of Boston. I don't live actually in the city, but... I'm born, I'm a typical New Englander. I was born here, I was raised here, and I'm probably never leaving. <laughs> but, I mean, I've, I've lived in other parts of the country that I thought were wonderful. I've actually, um, and it's not entirely true, I've lived two years, I lived overseas with my family in Japan, and I like the four seasons. I mean, I wish that winter was a little, a little bit shorter, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you live on the East Coast, just wait five minutes and the weather will change, right? That's right. So You've that, been that's, here. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, Laurie, I have to tell you, I live in, in uh, Windsor, Ontario, Canada, which is the city right across the river from Detroit. So we value summer more than most people around these parts because winter is entirely too long, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. You know, I get tired of snow like right around Jan uh, January 31st. That's about it. Uh, <laughs> it's like I'm ready for spring. Give me 80 degrees in base baseball every time, right now. <laughs> that's right. I'll that's, take it. <laughs> that's exactly right. And Laura, I I'm going to uh, combine my last two questions because the they're sort of interrelated. Uh, so if you had to sum up your life in one sentence, and and when your your legacy in life is over, how would you want that sentence to read? And when you look at your own uh, personal and professional legacy, how do you think you want that to be defined? Well, let's see. I want to make an impact to the people that I'm supposed to make an impact to, and. It, that, may, that may not be like some big global impact. If I do, fabulous. But I think what my job is, my purpose, my dharma, is to help other people know that their voices matter 
And I want them to speak. I want them to feel comfortable and confident when they speak up. So I hope that at the end of my life that um, not necessarily a big legacy, but I think it's more important that I feel like I did what I was supposed to do here. Yeah, absolutely. Life is all about paying it forward, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it, and just about being grateful for the experience that I did have while I was here. Yeah, not absolutely. about not about climbing that corporate ladder. Absolutely. You got to stop and uh, smell the roses. And very quickly, I'll give you a story and sort of a reality check for myself when I okay. uh, found that I, found that out for myself. So I used to be the lead job developer for the YMCA here in Windsor. And my boss's desk and my desk were directly across from each other. So I couldn't escape responsibility even if I wanted to. But anyway, my boss looked at me one day because uh, I was responding to one of her emails at 8 o'clock at night. And she, came in the next day and she said, you know, just because uh, an email is in your inbox doesn't necessarily mean you have to answer it all the time because I closed my computer at 4.30 and you're not going to get a response anyway until the next day. So she reminded me that life doesn't always have to revolve around work, right? That's so true. Those are healthy boundaries is being able to just kind of like close the electronic device and just being in the moment, being in the moment with your family, being in the moment with your friends, being in the moment with nature, whatever that being in the moment is. But yeah, I do believe that it's about closing those devices and noticing the world that you actually live in. And get outside, right? Yes, yes. I'm a big outside person. <laughs> And there's a benefit to that, absolutely. And Laura, tell me, if people want to get connected with a great more message, what's the best way they can do that? The best way that they can get a hold of me or keep learning from me is at my website, which is speakandstandout.com. And from there, you'll find other resources, um, my podcast, Instagram, and LinkedIn to follow me at. Fantastic. Well, Laura, for one motivational speaker to another. This was a delightful conversation of difference and that was one of the highlights of my afternoon. So I want to thank you for an engaging, informative, and thought-provoking and hopefully spirited conversa conversation of diff difference. Your work in the space and time on my behalf is most appreciated. And I want to thank you for being here today. It's most appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a deep pleasure on my end.